But until then, let's stand together and get your Bibles and turn with me to the gospel according to John once again. And we're going to be in John chapter 6, beginning in verse 60. John chapter 6, beginning in verse 60. John chapter 6, beginning in verse 60, the word of God reads, it says, many therefore of his disciples, when they had heard this, said, this is a hard saying, who can hear it? And when Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured at it, he said unto them, does this offend you? What and if ye shall see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before? It is the spirit that quickeneth the flesh, profiteth, it is the spirit that quickeneth rather, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. For there are some of you that believe not. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not and who, would, and who should betray him. And he said, therefore said I, unto you that no man can come unto me except it were given unto him of my father. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Then said Jesus unto the 12, will you also go away? Then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life, and we believe and are sure that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God, Jesus answered them, Have not I chosen you twelve, and one of you is a devil? And he spake of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, for he, for he it was that should betray him, being one of the twelve. Looks like Paul's made it back. We're going to pray. When I get done praying, then you guys can make your way out. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Fathers, we bow before you again this evening. We thank you so much for the opportunity just to gather here and to sing those old songs of the faith. I'm thankful, Lord Jesus, that we can be anchored in you and that though this, this old life is uh, shifty, it's difficult, it's ever-changing, it's uncertain, but you are our solid rock in whom we stand. And so we can be anchored in you. We can be like the tree planted by the river that uh, has a, a sure stronghold and a good foundation. And so, Lord Jesus, I pray that as we look to your word tonight, whether it's me in here, whether it's the young people in different places in the facility, I pray that as your word is proclaimed and taught, that each one of us that are within the sound of the word being proclaimed, that we would have ears to hear it, and our hearts would be willing to receive what you have to say to us. And Lord Jesus, I ask that you would help me to preach tonight, give me a fresh anointing of your spirit to do so, be with the other teachers as they teach and anoint them. And I pray, Lord Jesus, that you would save the lost, revive the saved, and do work in our midst as we desire for you to show up as we look to your word. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You all can be dismissed. The rest of you can be seated. And as we are here in John chapter 6, uh, we have, uh, in John chapter 6, had seen some pretty awesome things. Uh, we've already talked about the feeding of the 5,000 and how that Jesus looked upon the crowd that had hunted him down. He had went across the sea there of Galilee, and when he got over there, there was he sitting with his disciples, and as he was sitting with his disciples, he looks, and here comes a huge crowd, not just a few stragglers, but 5,000 men were following after him. I mean, I could... I don't know what I'd do. You know, it was like today we had a little uh, opening day ceremony over there in Clay County with their Little League, and, and they decided to recognize some of the, the players of the past. There was several Little League teams, softball teams, that maybe won the state tournament, and we had a couple teams that went pretty far in the Little League. I mean, they, they won a central region. They, they got pretty far um, as they were uh, going through this program. Anyway, we recognize some of them today, and, 
and they just kind of last minute asked me if I would be kind of the MC to, to do that. So I was doing that, and there's this lady who, who I used to pastor. Uh, she's related to Priscilla, and her name is Alvina. And uh, somebody clapped or something while I was speaking, and she looked over at Julie, and she said, Lord, if they start clapping for him, we'll never get out of here. <laughs> uh, I said, she knows me. She does say, you better not amen him. You better not clap him because he'll keep on going. And so I was saying that to say that if all, all of a sudden I'm looking out and here comes the crowd of 5,000 and they're piling in here um, and they got to open up the doors or we got to move to the gym. We got to figure out a way to get them where we can. Hey, I'm probably going to keep on preaching. You know, so Jesus seen the crowd and he seen it as a great opportunity but as he sat them down, he also knew that they had some physical things they had need of. They needed something to eat. They were traveling. They needed to sit down and rest, and they needed something to eat. And so when he looks over his disciples and say, hey, where are we going to get something to eat? And one of them said, hey, there's no way that we can feed them. We don't have enough money for that. It, it would take about a whole year's worth of, of, of wages to be able to just get something for them, just have a little bit of. And Jesus says, looking around and said, well, you guys sit down, have them sit down. And one said, well, here's a little sack lunch. Here's this, yeah, this lad that has a few fish and bread. And Jesus said, okay. And so he took that bread and that fish and he broke it as he, after he blessed it. And he fed the 5,000. And the rest of the folks that may have been around with them, the women and children that may be present as well. And he fed them and they were all full and they had leftovers. And he addressed the crowd initially. He addressed them and said the reason that they had showed up was because of the miracles that they had experienced. They had seen him heal so many different people. If you look in chapter 5, it kind of mentions that. And we've said it many times. We just have the, the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And that was sufficient to the Lord to give us what we needed in the recording of the works of Jesus. But folks, he did so much more that we don't really have recorded and, and preserved for us today. And I'm sure one day when we get to glory, that we'll have an understanding as we've never had before. And maybe we'll, we'll get to be told or we'll maybe already know it. I don't know how it all work. But, but maybe we'll learn more about what Jesus did while he was here. And maybe just in the three and a half years of his ministry, to be just outstanding to think about everything that he did. And so you can understand why the crowds would get big. They would want to experience the fact that he did all these miracles and he did all these things that blessed all these people. And so the crowd followed him for that. And then he fed them. And after he fed them, he went on the other side of Galilee. And when they got up the next day, I, I guess I shared with you before kind of a speculation on what I think. Here's Jesus. He breaks the bread, the fish. He feeds the folks. They get full. They get content. Uh, they're just doing whatever they're doing. And he somehow, with his disciples, they leave. And nobody notices that he leaves until the next day they're hungry again. And they're looking around like, where's Jesus? You know, uh, we need our bellies full again. Where's he at? And somebody said, well, I'm not sure exactly, but I, th I think he may have slipped away, and, and, and I think he may have went again on the other side of, of the Sea of Galilee, and I'm sure they're like, man, we got to go back over there again? But they hunted him down again. And when they hunted him down again, he says to them, you're not here today because of the miracles that you witnessed. You're here today because you had your bellies full, and you are laboring for the meat that perishes. He said, you're searching me so your bellies could be full again. And he says, you don't need to labor for those types of things. You don't need to be working for something that's going to perish away. It's kind of like when you look over in the gospel of Matthew, and in Matthew chapter 6, I believe it is, he, he, he begins to, he talks about, if you seek first the kingdom of God and, and his righteousness, then you don't have to labor really for the things that perish. Meaning, you don't have to be concerned about the food you're going to eat. You don't have to be worried and concerned about where you're going to lay your head down to sleep. You don't have to worry about the clothes that you have necessity of. Jesus said, 
God knows what needs you have. So seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and you let him take care of the things that are going to perish. And there's no reason for you and I today to kill ourselves for what? What do we do most of the time? I mean, we're going to go and we're going to work. Everybody does it. Most people do it. Let me put it that way. You get up and you work and you work for what? So you have something to eat, somewhere to go home to, something to drive, something to wear, a little maybe extra, hopefully, to be able to do a little bit, whatever you think you want to do. But we, we, we work a lot for things that don't matter. And we work for things that are going to perish away. And Jesus said in Matthew 6, listen, if you'll seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, God knows exactly what you have need of. And he'll take care of that as you strive to live for him the things that have eternal value. Here he says in John chapter 6, don't labor for the meat that perisheth. And then he goes on to explain unto them who he is, that he came down from heaven, that he's the bread of life. And they start saying things like, hold on, uh, Moses gave our fathers in the past the manna in the wilderness. And Jesus explains, no, uh, you're, first of all, Moses didn't give them anything. Second of all, your fathers that ate the manna in the wilderness, where are they today? They are dead. But he says, you need to eat of that which brings about eternal life. And he goes on to explain unto them being the, the bread of life, talking about the fact that you must partake of his flesh, partake of his blood, that you may have eternal life. And as he gives such a teaching, it became, becomes very difficult for them to understand. Jesus is not talking about literally eating of his flesh and drinking of his blood. But what he is talking about is being one with him, being completely committed to him. See, this is a, uh, this is a huge um, commitment where one, as Paul would say, dies to ourself, but now lives for Christ. That's what Jesus is talking about. He, he's talking about being a partaker of him, being one with him. You know, when you give your life to Jesus, you turn from your sin and you start living for him. You know what you're saying? You're saying goodbye to the old man. You're saying goodbye to the ways of the world. You're saying now I'm going to be alive in Christ. I'm dying to my old self. And Paul says like this in Romans, if your man dies to sin, how then is he going to live in sin? He can't do it no more because a dead man can't live in sin. He can't sin. So die to yourself and be raised to walk in the newness of life in the Lord Jesus Christ. But again, the key to it is you got to die to yourself. He says it like this in Romans 12, that we're to present ourselves unto him as a living sacrifice, meaning that we ourselves are not living for ourselves anymore, as he says in the church of Corinth, for you're not your own. You've been paid for. You've been bought with a price. Not things such as silver and gold that perishes, but by the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. How many understand today that if you trust in Jesus, and that's the thing about being saved, that a lot of times people just, they don't always tell the whole truth. I hate to say that about Christians, but as we're telling people about Jesus and we tell them about being saved, there's a lot of times what we do, I don't know if we do it necessarily on purpose. I think sometimes we do it because we're afraid that if we give it all at the same time, then people are going to be afraid and back out. But let me tell you something, you can't, you can't leave nothing out. When you're talking to a lost person and you want someone to come to Jesus, guess what you got to tell them to do? They got to Admit that they're a sinner. That's big, right, in the first place. Not only that, to admit they're a sinner, guess what they got to do as well? Repent. That means you got to take a, have a change of mind and heart about your sin. Now, you can't get cleaned up before you get saved, but you have to come to an acknowledgement that you are a sinner and you have to have the grace of God for you to be clean. But in order for you to experience the grace of God, if you're going down this path of sin, you have got to do an about face and come to the cross. You, you, can't, you can't continue in a life of sin with no attitude of repentance and think you're going to get saved. Doesn't work that way, folks. You've got to acknowledge your sinfulness. You've got to be like the old publican that got, who looked down to the ground and beat on his chest and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. 
You've got to come to that acknowledgement. And so here Jesus talking about eating of his blood and, or drinking of his blood and eating of his flesh. He said, you've got, you got to be one with me. You've got to, you've got to come and, and be committed to me. These folks didn't completely understand what he was saying, but he was giving them the hard truth about following after him. And he was teaching there in one of the synagogues in Capernaum when, he, when, when, when this was going down. And so when you get to verse 60, he says, many therefore of his disciples. Remember, there was a large crowd following. So you have the 12 that we're accustomed to hearing about, but he, but he, but he labeled the folks who were around him that were following after him, at least they appeared to be committed to him, he called them disciples as well. And so as he's talking this truth about being committed to him, being one with him, when you're talking about this, it says, many therefore of his disciples, when they had heard this, said, this is a hard saying, who can hear it? And so I want to ask you a question. Are you in or are you out? And that's what I want us to think about tonight. Are you in or are you out? How many understand you can't ride the fence? If, you, if you're going to live for Jesus, you're either in, and if you're not going to live for him, you're out. There's, there's no riding the fence here. You know, there's, there's really, as, as many times we, I think, at least in my mind, I can't say for everybody, but in my mind, at one time or another, I, I would think about someone being saved. It would be as if they were kind of in the middle here. And it was like, hey, I, I, if either I'm going to trust in Jesus and then I'm going to, be, I'm going to get saved, I'm going to be over here, or if I don't trust in Jesus, then I'm going to die one day lost and go to hell. It's like one side or the other. But then when you read the Bible, John chapter 3 tells us that we're already over here. There's never a middle of the road. There's never a fence that you're on. You start out on the lost side. You start out on the path that leads to a, the lake of fire, the second death. That's where we already start. It's not like we're making a decision and then we make the wrong decision and we end up over here. No, we're already there. And to get out of that place, we have to trust in the person and the works of Jesus Christ. Then we get delivered over here. That's how we get saved, right? Sometimes people don't understand the terminology and they're like, saved from what? What do you mean by that? Delivered from what? Well, you're already lost. You're already in your sin. You're already a child that was subject to the wrath of God. You're a child of the devil. You're blind. You're in darkness. You're dead and you're trespassing sin. You're on the broad path that leads to destruction. You need a savior. You need somebody who is perfect and without sin to pay your debt. And that's what Jesus did. And so as, as Jesus is, is speaking with these disciples, these, these folks that are following after him, he already confronted them about why they were searching him. First time because of the miracles, the second time because they were hungry. He, he tells them they're not really all that sold out to him. In John chapter 2, you're going to see that, that as Jesus was doing some miracles, there were several people that followed after him. And he says that he would not commit himself unto them because he knew their hearts. See, just because folks show up to worship services, just because people can carry a Bible, just because somebody can say a prayer, just because somebody gives money an offering plate, teaches a class, preaches a sermon, sings a song, drives a bus. I told you many times over, if you're going to get to heaven by your works, it's got to be through driving a bus, but it's not going to work that way either. You know, I mean, that's a tough job. And if you're going by going to earn it, it's going to be those maybe driving the buses. But that thing, you can't get to heaven that way either. It's only through the person and the works of Jesus Christ. And so even though there may be a crowd and even though you may be a part of the crowd, the question is, are you actually in the fold? Not just in the crowd. So he's the good shepherd, and he's calling out his sheep. And those that hear his voice and come unto him, they become part of the fold. In John chapter 10, he speaks of this, 
And he's talking to the Jews at that time, but he says he also has sheep that are not of this fold, meaning that there's both Jew and Gentiles that he's searching. He is that good shepherd looking for that lost sheep. And so as the crowd is around, there's a big crowd, but they're not all committed to him. They're experiencing the blessings. They're experiencing the food. They're experiencing the miracles. They're enjoying the sermons. Now, those things are all fine and dandy, but they ain't really partook of him. They're really not sold out to him. You know, Jesus said it like this in some other ways. He tells the one, to come follow him, and he says something like this, let me go bury my father first. His father wasn't dead yet. What the guy was saying is, I'm gonna go home, I'll wait, when my dad dies, and I'll bury him, and I'll follow you. And Jesus said, listen, you let the dead bury the dead. You go preach the gospel. Another fellow said, well, I'll come with you, but let me go tell everybody bye at my house first. And he said, no, listen, a man that grabs hold of the plow and looks back is not fit for the kingdom of God. And that's, that's some pretty tough words, and it is pretty tough. Jesus said something like this. He said, listen, if you don't take up your cross daily, deny yourself, you can't be my disciple. He also said it like this, too. If you don't hate your mother, your father, your brother, your sister, your husband, your spouse, your wife, you can't be my disciple. I mean, these are some hard teaching. But when you talk about following Jesus, folks, you're being one with him, being committed to him. Hey, it's a matter of a line drawn in the sand. Are you in or are you out? Right? Where's your commitment? Is it going to be with Jesus and, and living for him or, or, or not? Are you just one of these folks on the fringe that likes to, when you're in time of trouble, cry out to God, hopefully he's going to hear you, hopefully he's going to answer like you want, or are you just part of those that are right around holding on the coattail of someone else? You know, I've seen this for years throughout the ministry. God's doing the work in, in the midst of a church, and you'll have folks wanting to take claim for that who's not committed no more than showing up and leaving every once in a while. They ain't really doing no work. They just are bystanders. They're just spectators. And then and when, 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 when things are rough, most of the time it's them same people that are agitators and the instigators. And that's what happened. But there's folks that... Are they just a part of the crowd or are they committed to the Lord Jesus? And so when we get here, he's talking this hard teaching and many of those disciples say, man, this is a hard saying. Who's going to be able to hear this? Who's who's going to be able to hear and receive it? It's tough. I'm just not sure about all this. I just don't know if I can be that committed. Eat of his flesh, drink of his blood. I mean, what was he talking about being one with him? What's it mean not having any part of him? This is some hard saying. And Jesus knew within himself that the disciples murmured at it, and he said unto them, does this offend you? Uh, Listen, I'm glad I can't do like Jesus. I'm glad I can't hear every thought. Amen? I'm glad of that. I'm glad I don't know the heart of, man, I'm glad my job is to, my calling is to get up here, preach the word, which it's a living word, so it's sharper than two-edged sword. It does its work. I just trust in the work of the person, the Holy Spirit of God, who comes to convict the world of sin and convince man they need to turn to Jesus. I'm glad I don't have to be the all-knowing person. I don't have to, to, to know what the murmuring is in one's heart or not going on. Right? I'm glad I don't have to know all that. Jesus in there teaching, and every time he's thinking, yeah, that person over there don't like what they just say. That group over there wasn't too fond of it. And instead of him just keeping that to himself, he just looks at him. What are you grumbling about? What are you murmuring about? You don't believe what I've got to say? He calls them out. You know, I don't know if you've ever felt that way, but I sure enough have from time to time. I, did, I, I wondered if the, teach, if the preacher knew what about me. Later on, I learned the preacher didn't know anything about me and come to understand it was God. It was God was the one that was reading my heart. It was God that seemed to make it open before everybody else, even though nobody else knew what I was thinking. I sure felt like it. I felt like it was right there for everybody. And I thought, I'm the only person here. I said, I'm, they must have the spotlight right on me. They must know where I'm at in this situation or that situation or what God was doing, but he didn't. But he asked, the, or they didn't, he did. They asked, he asked the question of them, does this offend you? 
what I'm saying. He said, what? And if ye shall see the Son of Man ascend up to where he was before. What if you see the Son of Man ascend up from where he came from? He said, it is the spirit that quickeneth. The flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. When Jesus was speaking to these folks and they were listening, he said, does this offend you? He says, what if you as the witness, the son of man ascend from where he came from? Remember, he said, I'm the true head. I'm the true bread that come down from the father. I'm the living bread. I, I come down from my father. No one's ever ascended up there. Nobody's ever seen the father, but I've seen the father. I've been with the father. I come down from the father. I am that bread, and for you eat, you shall have eternal life. And he says, you, you are offended by what I said. What happens if you get a witness to me ascend? And didn't some of them in the crowd witness? That They did. I mean, the 12 seen him. Uh, uh, there, right on the Mount of Olives, he ascended to the right hand of the Father. I mean, they get to see that. They saw it. But he asked, what if you witness this? And he says, it is the spirit that quickeneth, meaning that the spirit of God is what makes us alive. It is the work of God that makes us alive. And that's why earlier in John chapter six, he said this when they were struggling with, with, with receiving him and he told them, don't murmur amongst yourself. Again, he calls them out. He said in verse 44, no man comes to me except the father which has sent me draw him and I'll raise him up in the last days. He understood that when he's talking some spiritual things, that it was going to take the work of God and the life uh, of that was who are dead in their trespass and sin for them to be saved. He understood that. That's why I told you when God's doing the work in your heart, you don't reject him. You don't resist him. You don't turn him away. You come to him. See, if you're in, you take heed to that conviction, that drawing of the father. And you say yes as you surrender to him. I remember when I got saved, I, I prayed to receive Jesus as my own personal Lord and Savior. Never told anybody about it the first week or two. I, I prayed on a Sunday morning. I asked Jesus to come to my heart. I have no doubt in my mind that's when I got saved. And I didn't understand all of that at the time. It took some growing in the faith for me to understand that. But I prayed and received him. But when I made that, that my faith public, that was, I mean, that was a big step. And I remember sitting there in the worship service. It was on a Thursday night. I don't remember the exact day. Uh, I, I just remember that there was an evangelist preaching. I believe his name was Earl Taylor, I think. And, and he was preaching. And at the end of the service, in the invitation time, they sung, Just As I Am. Uh, I think there's 5,465 verses of that song. I think. I'm not 100% sure. But I think, and you say, well, that's kind of crazy. Well, you think? I know they sung it at least that many times. I mean, they just kept singing that song. One verse after another verse after another verse. And I thought, well, I can get through this song. It's just got four verses in the book. But that preacher said, we're going to keep on singing. And they kept on singing. I'm standing there, and I'm thinking, I need to go forward. But I'm like, ah, just give me a few more verses, and I, they'll be done. And I thought they were going to get done. That preacher said, all right, I want us to pray. And I want you to pray for the person until you're right and until you're left. And I'm right between my buddies. And I'm just hit by both of their prayers. I know I am because they've been praying for me already. And they didn't know that I had prayed during a Sunday morning service to receive Christ just a week or so before that, probably a couple weeks. And they didn't know that because I didn't tell nobody. So they're praying hard for me. And, and they start singing that song again. And I finally looked over at this little old lady because I need to get by her. And I said, I got to go. So I came from this side of the pew and I walked over here and I come down that aisle and I took that preacher by the hand and I talked to him and I prayed with him again. Uh, like I said, I didn't know a whole lot about what, what it took to be saved. And I didn't understand all of those things, but I, I prayed with him again that day and, 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 and went through with that with him. And, and then all of a sudden, uh, one of my buddies who I work with invited me to come to church on. He grabbed a hold of me 
and it felt like he was wanting to wrestle. We've done that several times on the job site, construction, and he had, seemed like he had me in a headlock uh, up there at the altar. And I thought I was fixing to die. I'm thinking, I'm glad that I'm saved because I can't even breathe right now. And, uh, but after, when I came forward like that, it was like a, it was like a load lifted off of me. It was making that public profession of faith. Just like Jesus said here, does this offend you? You know, what if you got to see the Son of Man ascend? And he said, it is the Spirit that quickened it. It's the Spirit that does a work. And that's what Jesus is trying to explain to these folks. When you're in, you understand that the Spirit of God is working and you are following that. That's how you know you're in, you know. The folks that are out, let me tell you what happens a lot of times. Well, not a lot, probably all the time. They're right there at the, the edge, you know. It's like Jesus talking about the sower and the seed, you know, right there. Uh, the, so, the gospel's sown, and a lot of the folks that, that are in the services, it, it falls on the stony ground, it falls on the thorny ground, and, 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 and all of a sudden it, it doesn't have really much root, and so... When the sun comes up, it, it, it scorches out that, uh, that, that, that plant that's trying to grow or over here by all where all the thorns are and the thistles are and, and the briars, when they try to grow up amongst that, they get choked out. The folks that are out, they have some experiences. They're folks that, that, that have experienced some, even some blessings, some benefits of being around the crowd as a whole. But they're not really in. They're just around it. The folks that are in, they're the folks that know that the Spirit of God is not working in their heart. That the Spirit of God has drawn them. That they said yes to that. They've come to Jesus. They've repented of their sin. And they start living for Him. Those are the folks that are in. Jesus makes reference. You know, why are you, why are you murmuring amongst yourself? Are you offended? You know, are you in or are you out? If you're in, you understand the spirit of God's what brings life, quickens you, makes you alive. He said, the flesh profiteth nothing. And he said this, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. I ask you a question. Have you ever, have you ever heard a message and you're like, that's spot on. I know that's right. Not only because you're looking at the word, but there is inside of you, you know it's right. You know it's right. I've sat in services, man, preacher's right on. And I'm like, that's money, right? I mean, that's right. His spirit, my spirit, they're bearing witness. The Holy Spirit's doing the work. I've also been in services, sat there like, I don't know about that. I've sat, I, listen, I sat under some preaching, and one time there was a revival right there in Bible College. We had a campus-wide revival, and I can't remember the guy's name. I can about see his face, but I can't remember his name. And, uh, but he was preaching. Oh, man, he preached hard. He preached straightforward uh, on, uh, as far as being in that personality. And I'm telling you, I mean, as far as that style, I like that style probably most than any other style. I mean, that man was, uh, I mean, shucking the corn. But. As much as his delivery was a style that I preferred, I'm telling you, I sat right there. I always sat close, even in chapel. I sit around the edge, sitting up close. He's all over the place while he's preaching. I'm telling you, something about it was not sitting well with me. Something about it. I can't seem to this day, can't tell you exactly what it is. Was he real off on some of his verses that he said or, or teach that? No. Wasn't about that. It was something else. And I can't tell exactly what it was, but it wasn't setting well with me. And, and, and I'll be honest with you, I think one of my gifts of the Spirit would be that of, of discerning the spirits. It was, I, I, something about it wasn't right. And I, I just, I, I told my friends that was, I said, man, I'm telling you, something is off with this fella. I don't know what it is, but he's off. And uh, I don't know, like I said, but Jesus says this, the, the words that I'm giving you, that I speak unto you, their spirit and life. 
So when he's talking about following after him, partaking of his blood, partaking of his flesh, being one with him, being committed to him, he said, these, these words, I'm giving you a spirit and life. I'm going to follow after me. Let me tell you something. The people that are in, guess what? This book, they want it. They want it. Hey, don't ever be deceived, folks. When you go to church services, and, 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 you, and they don't care if there's a big crowd or not, but I'm telling you something, there's a lot of big churches today, and let me, let me back that up. There's a lot of big congregations out there today. But that don't mean what they got going on is of God. And so when I think about that, I think about the fact that when you're going somewhere and, and, and you're listening, the questions you ask, is this, is this the words that are speaking? Are they, are they spirit and life? You know, is this the spirit that quickeneth or is this the flesh? Because when the word of God is proclaimed, the people that are in, guess what? They want the word. But you know what happens in a lot of times? There's congregations all over the place. And you know what? There ain't much there. This. This right here. Oh, man, they got some good singing. Oh, they got some good performances, I guess. And they got some stuff that's quality, you know. This pastor not too far uh, away from here, I remember one of his quotes he had there on his old Facebook account, and he said something like, um, since when is mediocrity necessarily spiritual? And what he's doing is throwing off on uh, some, of the, some of the local churches that may not have the same performances as him. And he had got a little bit of criticism for some of his performances. That's what I like to call it. And so, so he put something on there because he, he wants to make a point that because the product may be packaged and delivered better, that it must be true. I'm here to tell you something. If you want to sing for Jesus, y'all do the best you can. If you're going to preach, y'all do the best you can. If you're going to teach, you better do the best you can. If you're going to do something else, I don't care what it is. I don't care what it is. If you're helping clean, do the best you can. If you're going to work with these children, do the best you can. If you're going to cut the grass, do the best you can. If you're going to work back there in the sound booth, do the best you can. Whatever it is that you're doing, do the best you can. But just because you package it well and deliver it well don't necessarily mean that it's of God either. Okay? I want us to understand that. And so you need to do the best you can with the help of God. And at the end of the day, that's what we're supposed to do. Give ourselves unto him as a living sacrifice. Here am I, Lord. Here's the best I got. Here's all I got. Do what you can with it, you know. And guess what? He can do, he can do great things with it. And so we got to trust in that. But what I've seen is that sometimes there's a whole lot better appearance but there ain't no real substance. It's almost like cotton candy. Looks like there's a whole lot to it until you start eating on it. And then you're like, where did it all go? I mean, it disappears right in your mouth. Gone. You know, it's like, well, that was a whole lot, but now I didn't really get anything. Well, let me tell you something. If you ain't got this on the menu, you ain't eating much. You're not eating much. And so Jesus says, the words I give you, their spirit, their life. And he says this, but there are some of you that believe not. And he's talking to the whole crowd. He said, listen, I'm giving you the truth, and there's some of you in here that don't believe it. He said for this, for Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not and, and who should betray him. How many understand that? Jesus died on the cross for the sin of the world. I've said that this morning. Believe that with all my heart. But he also knew, knew, knows exactly who's going to receive him. He knows that. There's no question about that. He knows perfectly the beginning from the ending. And you and I don't know that. You and I don't know who, who these people out here that are going to say yes to the gospel and know the gospel. We don't know that. that and because he knows it doesn't mean that they don't have a free choice either. He knows perfectly what they're going to do with the free offer of salvation. You and I don't. So you and I are to go out here and tell everybody about Jesus and call everybody to come to him. 
and he's going to offer them eternal life, but he knows exactly who are going to come. And he also knows those who are going to murmur. And he's going to know those that are going to struggle with the truth. But he knows perfectly. And he told them, you know, I know exactly. You know, there's some of you here that believe not. And he said, therefore said I unto you that no man can come unto me except it were given unto him of my father. Again, he goes back to a truth that we need to all understand. If God's dealing with you, you need to come when he's dealing with you. Do not put it off. Because you say no to that, you're not just coming whenever you want to. If you're in, guess what happened? You came when he called. Huh? I remember when I was growing up, we didn't have cell phones. We didn't have that. I remember when I, I tried to give me a, I did give me a pager before I started driving, 14, 15 years old. I was working and I begged my mom, let me get a pager. She's like, you don't need a pager? I said, well, let me get a pager. You know, I thought it was a cool thing. She said, only people that need pagers are drug dealers and you ain't getting a pager. Well, I convinced her that I'm not a drug dealer and I never was a drug dealer. And, uh, uh, but I still need a pager. And so she didn't let me get a pager and I paid for the pager and the payment and all that other stuff, the plan and all that other stuff because I worked and I did that. But, but anyway, we didn't have cell phones and that type of stuff. So she would, when we'd be outside, she would, she would come outside and she'd get out there on the porch or on the, on the sidewalk there in the apartment complex and she'd yell. I mean, as loud as she could yell. And we had to hear her. And if we didn't hear her come, uh, there's some times if you didn't get there, son, she just locked you out. Time to come in. And if you didn't come when you're supposed to, she just locked you out. And you had to come banging on the door. Then she had to say, hey, I'm going to yell for you, you know, and you ain't hearing me. And I don't know if I'm going to let you in or not. Uh, I'm glad that she did let me in. I never had to sleep out at night. But, but she would at least put a little hindrance at it for a while anyway. And my point is, when God's calling, though, you better come. Because when he shuts the door, and if you don't believe me, just go back to the book of Genesis, and you'll see when there was the flood, and Noah was out there preaching and calling people to come, and he was building the ark all at the same time. And when God's time was up, and he put Noah and his family in the boat, and he put all the animals in the boat, and guess what he ended up doing? He shut the door, and when he shut the door, there was no opening the door. Noah couldn't open the door. I never thought of it a whole lot, thinking about what Noah was feeling in that direct instance, but I'm sure that he would probably tried to open it. I'm sure he did. I'm sure Noah was a compassionate person. I doubt he was sitting in there like, Psh. You should have listened when I told you. I don't think he probably had that attitude. I bet when the, when the water started busting on the earth and the waters broke from above the earth and it started coming down and people tried to get to the boat, I bet the first thing he tried to do was try to get it open. But you know what? Noah wasn't the man that closed it and Noah wouldn't be the man to open it. And we know according to book of Revelation, when God opens the door, no man shuts it. But when God shuts the door, no man opens it either. And so Jesus tells these folks, I know you're murmuring. I know that you don't want to believe what I've got to say. That's why I've also told you that if you're going to come, you're going to come when the Father tells you to come. You're not coming just on your own whenever you want. You better take heed when the Father calls. You need to come then. Those that are in, they want the word. Those that are in, they're willing to make the commitment. Those that are in, take heed to the call when God is calling them. So then it says in verse 66, from that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Have you ever wondered from time to time 
Where do those folks go to? I've wondered that. You say, what folks? You know what folks I'm talking about. The folks that used to come, but they don't come no more. The folks that walked out, folks that went through the baptismal water, the folks that found the, the, the secret exit back there somewhere. You say, what do you mean by that? Well, they came in, they got wet, they went out there. I don't know where they went to. They went out that back door, they never came back. You know what I'm talking about? I'm talking about the folks that make up the church row, but they ain't never here. Hey, this is a across every local church issue here. I'm telling you. You start most churches that keep up with membership, I'm telling you. Most, ain't, ain't, their attendance ain't nowhere close to what's on their church roll. And most of the time, you don't even know where them folks are. Part of it is they don't clean them up like they're supposed to, and someone dies, they ain't necessarily fixing that. Or if somebody moves away, they ain't necessarily fixing that. It's just kind of just kind of a, a lazy way of keeping up with some things. But a lot of times, it's like folks come, folks are apart for a little while, and folks leave. You, you know what? Some of the biggest things that, that I've read about and heard about is when church, when churches decide they want to do some purging of their records. And, and I've heard of, of churches putting something in the paper saying such and such church is cleaning up their church roll. And if you're a member here and you know your name's on this roll, we need to hear for you. We're taking you off church roll. Hey, you talk about people getting tore up. They don't want to come to church, but they don't want their name to go off the roll. I mean, it don't make any sense. They don't want to be a part of the ministry. They don't want to give. They don't want to, they don't want to have no commitment. They don't really want you to call them. They don't want you to visit them. They don't want you to check on them. They just want to be able to be on the roll and say, yeah, I, I, you know, I go to church down there. I started doing this when I talked to people. And I say, hey, come, I want to invite you to come to church, tell them about Jesus. Say, oh, I go to such and such church. I said, who's that pastor down there? Uh, uh. And then that person's been there a long time. I said, man, what did he preach on last Sunday? Uh. That's because that's an easy out for most folks. You say the right thing, folks are like, most people, oh, okay, you go to church, I'm sorry, we don't want to take no, nobody from another church, you know, and we just kind of leave you alone with that. So if you know the right thing, ways to answer, you can get away from them, these preachers and these folks that come and talk to you. But you can't get away from Jesus like that. Or if you do want to put him off, what's going to end up happening is you're going to put him off too long. And it says, from this time Forward, there was many folks, many of his disciples that went back. And they didn't walk with him anymore. They quit chasing him every time he went on the other side of the Sea of Galilee. You know what they did? They decided, maybe I don't want to have any of that fish anymore. I mean, it was pretty good and it filled me up. But man, when he started talking about being committed, I think I'll settle for some other food. Or if you start thinking about the miracles that were going on and, and some of them were following because of that and they experienced some of those blessings and, and no doubt that was good for them. They were sick and now all of a sudden they're not or whatever it is that, that they benefited. And then, but, but then all of a sudden when Jesus starts talking about, hey, it's more than just having a physical healing. We're talking about being committed to me where you have eternal life. We're talking about dying to yourself. We're talking about just turning your back on the world and following after. I, I don't know if I want to do if people say, I'm just not ready for that. Preacher, don't push me too hard. Don't push me too hard. You know, we all have that mentality too. I don't say much to my family because I'm afraid I might push them away. Let me tell you something. You ain't careful. You ain't careful. Your family members going to wake up in a place of torment. All because you're worried about pushing them away from Jesus. Well, they never came to Jesus. And we got to do all things in love. But let me tell you something. Sharing the gospel, it's confrontational. Sharing the gospel is not always comfortable. There are plenty of times it's not being comfortable sharing the gospel with somebody. Because all of a sudden you get down to the place of what are you going to do with this? And not only is it uncomfortable because God's doing a work in their heart, but it's also uncomfortable because you're afraid they're going to look at you and say, I don't want to talk to you about this no more. 
And you know what? That's happened to me a million times. At least it felt like that. My grandpa felt like that happened all the time. To, to the point where I almost just said, you know what? I give up. You know? I'm tired of him looking at me and saying, I don't want to hear that. I'm tired of him telling me, hey, you know, talk about everything else. And then when I start talking about Jesus with him, he just shuts up like I've just done the worst thing. That, that, that's hard to deal with sometimes, especially with your loved ones. But you know what? My papa, he's in heaven right now because I didn't stop. And he got saved right before he died. I'm thankful for that, you know. But here, many of them left. If you're in, you're not leaving. I'm here to tell you. If you're in, you're not having statements like this. I don't need to go to church. I can do this on my own. Uh, that ain't what the Bible teaches. You're not in. I'm telling you, you're not in if you don't think you, there is any need for you to be a part of what God's doing, folks. You're not in. You say, you can't see my heart. Hey, I don't have to see your heart. I know what the book says. A born-again believer, they're going to come to Jesus. They're going to have some fruit. If they get out of line, he's going to bring discipline in their life. And they're going to want the word. And they're going to want to line up with the book. I'm not saying they don't have some issues. I'm not saying we never sin. I'm not saying that there isn't some correction. But, but, if, but if you want to be outright defiant to the word of God and the ways of God, I don't believe you in. And if you want to take that chance, I hope you're right. But I'm not going to live like that. I never have been a gambler. And I am not going to gamble on that. When I was growing up, my friends, they like to play craps. They like to take him dice. We'd sit there before the bus, and we'd they want to shake dice, and we'd sit right there at the bus stop and play. Well, that looked like a pretty fun game, you know? And everybody liked to play it. But when they start putting money down, I'm like, I don't think I'm gonna play. Come on, just a couple dollars. I say, yeah, man. I get paid four dollars and twenty-five cents an hour at that time. Man, it took me an hour to get four dollars and twenty-five cents. And you think I'm going to give it to you in, like, a shake? I don't think so. I don't think so. I'm just not a gambler. I never have. I don't think there's anything good in it. I don't like the mint down the road. I don't like these machines in these gas stations. I don't like the lottery. I don't like none of that stuff. I think it's crazy. I think it's sports gambling, all that stuff. I think it's a mess. I think it destroys people. I think it destroys family. I think it's bad for the communities. I don't think there's anything good in it. But I sure ain't going to take a gamble on where I'm going to spend eternity. Now, I'm not saved by my works. I've been saved by the grace of God. But the grace of God that saved me has changed my desires, folks. Then I don't, I don't come to church like, oh, man, I don't want to be there. There's times that I've been tired. There's times, I'll be honest, I ain't always wanting to get up there and preach. And listen, churches sometimes will wear you out. And I'm not talking about ministering to them. I'm talking about all the petty garbage that goes on a lot of times in churches. And, and there's been times that I have preached, I've sung, I've done a lot of things and go about with a smile on my face and handshaking and everything else with folks I know that are in the process of literally just stabbing me in the back. Just like Jesus ministered to Judas and was there the whole time. That's the same way. There's been times I can say I have not always been the most enthusiastic person of being around some of these folks. But living for Christ, I have never, on, as God is my witness, said, ain't no way that I want to live for Jesus or he ain't worth it. Uh-uh. Folks, when he saved me and displayed his grace and mercy and love in my life, such an undeserving person of that, Man, I want to follow him. I want to live for him. I want to tell the people about him. I want to learn more about him. I want to worship him. I want to sing unto him. You know? What do you want to say? And this is, I, I, I can stay here all night, and I'm not going to. I may come back later at it, but let's just read as he asks, are you in or are you out? He asks this to 
the 12, he said, will you also go away? Will you go away? And then verse 68, Simon Peter answered. Now, you remember Simon? You know, they called him Peter. How many times did he say the wrong things? Many times. But I'm going to tell you what. There's been a couple times, and listen, <laughs> he had a lot of mistakes. But I'm going to tell you what. He said at least two different times some of the most profound things. You know, some of the most profound. This was one of them. He messed up later on, but look what he said. He said, you, you guys are going to go away too? Is the crowd starting thinning out? You in or you out? You know, I see Jesus, that crowd's thinning out. He already knows they're going to follow him. But he looks over those 12. He said, what about you all? Are you in or are you out? And Simon Peter said, Lord, to whom shall we go? Who are we going to go to? He said, thou hast the words of eternal life. Well, when you back up, verse 63, Jesus said, the words I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. What did Peter do here? He amen that truth. He said, Lord, to whom are we going to go to? You have the words of eternal life. And look what he says in verse 69. And we believe and are sure that thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. Oh, man, you're in when you know that you know that you know and whom you have believed in and trusted in. Oh, listen, these folks that are wishy-washy, these folks that ain't sure, when I got saved, I didn't have all, like I said, I didn't have all understanding. I, I, it took me a while to, to get a grasp on some theological things, to, to me to have a, a, a solid understanding of, of my salvation. But I came to Christ initially as a child, humbled myself, turned from my sin, and just simply fell at his feet and, and, and depended upon his grace and mercy. But I know who I trusted then. And then the more that I understood his word, the more sure I became in that, that, that time of commitment, that belief. And so the folks that are this wishy-washy stuff, let me tell you something. I have a hard time believing you in. Because God is not the author of confusion. He does not want you out there, well, I think I'm saved, or I hope that I'm saved, or I might be saved, or I go to church. Right? You say, oh, yeah, I, I'm saved. Um, I got baptized when I was 13 years old. I didn't ask you a thing about being baptized. I mean, that's good to know. But are you saved? Are you truly born again? You know? Or are, are you truly washed in the blood of the Lamb? That's the question. And, and Peter says, Lord, who are we going to go? Who are we going to go to? Who, who else are we going to follow? You're the ones that have the words of eternal life. And we believe and we are sure. This ain't a, this ain't a maybe so type thing. This is a no so type thing. We believe and we are sure that thou art the Christ. You are the anointed one. You are the promised seed of Genesis 3.15. You're the one that Moses and the prophets spoke of and the law was pointing to. You are the Christ, and we know and believe and are sure that you are the Son of the living God. You are the God-man. And when you're in, you know it. Huh? You know, I remember when I was ordained into the ministry and I took the first church I pastored was Hosman Baptist Church in Pineville, Kentucky, on 92, like going to Williamsburg, the old way from, from outside of Pineville. And a uh, little church there, right? They called Magnet Holler. And a uh, little church sitting right there. And uh, as I was said yes to the call to pastor that church in the First Baptist Church, South Lebanon, uh, set aside an ordination council who had then ordained me into the gospel ministry. And, and so I had to speak with that council. And they had some questions for me. 
And uh, one of the questions that they asked me was, if we don't ordain you, are you still going to preach the gospel? Are you still going to preach if we, if we don't ordain you here? And uh, my answer to them was, yes, I'm going to preach. I know that God's called me to preach. I know beyond a shout of doubt, that's what he wanted me to do. I know that I'm saved, first of all, and then I know that he's called me into the ministry specifically to preach the gospel, and now he's gave me clarity to be a pastor, and this is the church that I'm going to pastor. And so if, if you recognize that call in my life, and that's the church where I got saved, was baptized, was called in the ministry, and they supported me when I went on to Bible college, um, they've observed my life. I said, if you have observed my life and you, you, know, you guys are confident that you believe that God's also called me, you're willing to, to send me out with that by, uh, by sim- the, through the symbolic way of ordaining me, um, then, then I'm grateful for that. But if you don't think so, that's not going to deter me from preaching. I'm just going to go preach. I'll have to just now, I'll, have to, I'll just have to cross that bridge when I get there. I'll just have to go back and tell Church here at Hosman, listen, I, I don't know exactly what the deal is, and maybe they'll give me a reason, but they're not going to ordain me there. Um, so then now they're going to have made decision if they, if they think that God's called me there because they're the ones that thought that in the first place. So, And then I went, and, I, and in my prayer, I believe that too. So anyway, my point is I was sure, not only about my salvation, but my calling. And there's nobody else going to tell me any different. Just like knowing that I'm going to heaven, you know. I, I love when, when people say little comments that like, if you go to heaven. You know, I love when they say something like that. Now, I don't think they necessarily mean that in a bad way, but sometimes it's like a comment, like, because they just ain't really sure exactly how to approach it. And I just look at them like, what do you mean if? I know where I'm going. I don't know about you, but I know where I'm going. I'm going to heaven when I die or when Jesus comes. I know that. Now, I'm sure of that. I'm as sure of that, more sure of that than I am of anything else. That's the facts. I'm more sure of that than anything else. And the reason that I'm more sure of that than anything else is because of the word of God, just like Peter said, where else am I going to go? Who else am I going to believe? I know whom I have believed, and I am sure that he is the Son of God who became the Son of Man, who died on the cross for my sin, who rose again from the dead overcoming my sin, and I know that when I ask him to save me, he saved me. I know that. I'm thankful for that. I know whom I have believed, and I am persuaded that he's able to keep that which I've committed to him even against that day. No questions here, folks. No question. Oh, I've been deceived before. I've been tricked before. I have thought I knew somebody, and I didn't. When it comes down to my Lord and my Savior, hey, I know because it's here, folks. It's here. If you're in, you know it. If you're not sure, you need to come and be sure. Settle it, right? No reason to not be sure. I'm going to ask Brother Dwayne to make his way. Are you in or are you out? Huh? And you know, I'm I'm not necessarily talking about your commitment to this local church, but I will say this without any reservation, whether it's this local church or another Bible-believing local church, you need to find yourself committed to it if you're in, if you're in. I know there's some bumps in the road as we go through our Christian walk. I understand there's some times where where we, we go through things and maybe we're not involved in the local churches we are supposed to be. You know, and there's some excuses. I don't really think there's any good excuses. I know we have hard times. I know that we can be rocked and rattled, and sometimes the hardest things we go through happen right there amongst those who, who we think are the people of God, and we think they love us, and we think they love God, and then, then we go through things that most people have probably haven't went through some type of church hurt. And even if that's rattled you from here and time and, you know, time and time again or here and there or whatever, 
That's still not an excuse not to be committed to the body of Christ. It's just not. It means that you and I need to to find the church, and you're not going to find a perfect one, because as soon as you find one, you show up, you're going to mess that up. Okay? But as you get to the church, you find a church that's preaching the word. You find a church that's teaching the word. You find a church that's trying to not only win the lost, but make disciples. You, those types of things you have to look for. It's not always necessarily what's the biggest, what's the brightest, what's the, the hippest, the whatever. It, it's, it's finding a church as you seek God to put him in a local church, put you in a local church where you can use the gifts and talents that God's given you so that you can edify the church, glorify God, and then also the church there can help edify you and glorify God as we work together. So when we think about being in, you can't separate the Lord and his church. Can't do it. And I know because the book of Ephesians said so. When he talks about two becoming one, he said, I'm telling you, showing you something like a mystery. I'm talking about not just husband and wife, I'm talking about the church and Christ. You can't separate those two. And so I say, are you in? Do, do you hunger for the word? Do you know who you will believe? Are you persuaded? Are you willing to, to be all in? Well, what about you today? Are you in or are you out? Are you just a part of the crowd until all of a sudden he separates or, or, or something you just don't like, you decide I'm, I'm out of here? What about you? Let's pray. Father, we bow before you tonight ask you to move during this invitation. Maybe there's somebody here that's not just sure if they're in or not. And if they're not sure, I pray that they would come and make that sure. Maybe there's some folks here and, or listening or, or watch that, that say, you know what? I'm in the crowd, but I'm really not of the fold. I pray that they would become part of the fold as you deal with their hearts, as you bring conviction, and that they would say yes to the free gift of eternal life. Lord, whatever it is that you've said to us, I pray that you, we would respond to you because your words are spirit and are life. And, and it's, we need to take heed. And let us not ignore you, quench you, grieve you, but let us say yes to you. And we thank you for your grace. We thank you for your long suffering. We ask you to move during this time. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.